If you have your Bibles in wood, please, let's turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Several, uh, oh, probably about a month ago, I was uh, looking over uh, some verses, and this verse really stuck to my heart. And we used it in the bus ministry for one Sunday uh, for one of the memory verses for our bus kids. And then uh, we uh, talked about it at the nursing home, and it was just something that really uh, spoke to my heart. And I thought, you know, the Lord really wants to do something in you and in me, and he tries to help us. And he says, listen, I'm going to tell you some things. I'll give you some things. I'm going to tell you what to do, and I'm going to tell you how it's going to turn out. Amen. And that's awful good. You wish you could have that happen all the time, and it would work out that way. But we find here in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, if you would, please. Proverbs, chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at uh, the first six verses of Proverbs, chapter 3. Beginning to read with verse 1. It, oh, well, I'll stand for that, if you don't mind, if you're up to it, you'd like to. Amen. All right. <clears throat> as our custom is. All right. Uh, let's stand as we'll read verses, beginning to read with verse 1. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Amen. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, Amen. and lean not unto thine own understanding. Amen. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you would bless as we look at these verses tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to apply them to our hearts and to our lives, and help us, Lord, just to allow you to do something in us tonight. Amen. In Jesus' dear name, amen. Let me have a seat. Several years, well, 1986, <coughs> I had this great idea. My, uh, we had a, a little red EXP. It's a two-seater. And sometimes we would bring some bus kids to church. And at one time, uh, Pam had brought about 14 kids to church in an EXP. That's a two-seater little teeny Ford uh, car. And so we thought, we're going to get us a, a little bit bigger car. We're going to get us a station wagon. Uh, and it's an LTD2. Matter of fact, that was the car that I drove when we came here to Delaware, when we started working here in Delaware. And uh, it, was, it was something else. I went to look at it and everything, and there was a deacon in the church, and his name was Charles Shahan. Mr. Shahan was just a great man. He was a godly man. He loved people, and he loved us. And uh, he told me, he said, uh, he says, brother, he says, don't get that car. And I said, but brother Shahan, we can use it. And he says, don't get that car. He says, you don't need that car. You need to get something else, and don't get that car. You know what happened? We got the car. <laughs> we got the car, and oh, it was about a year or so, maybe, uh, and that car blew up <laughs> while we were still paying for it. And, uh, and guess who we borrowed a car from? Mr. Shahan. Uh, Mr. Shahan gave us the car and uh, let us use that car while we were getting that one fixed. And while we, we had that, we took, it all, took the engine all apart, what happened was uh, it had overheated and cooked the engine. So we had it all taken apart, had all the ports cleaned, supposedly, and all this kind of stuff, and we had it put back together. And I put that engine back in that car uh, two days before I drove over here to, to uh, speak with uh, Pastor Fowler about uh, teaching here and, and being a part of the church here at Capitol. I started it up, and it ran great for the first minute. And then, all of a sudden, it just had this miss. Uh, come to find out, what had happened was the number one cylinder was dead. The oil port that was going to the lifter had, uh, was completely clogged, and so therefore, I lost the first cylinder. And uh, so there was, no, there was no running it. And it stayed that way as long as we had that car. And you know... Sometimes there's some things that you don't see. I couldn't see that port. I didn't do the work on it, but it didn't matter. Even though there's things that you don't see, 
today, it can affect you for the rest of your life. I want us to look here at this, at this little brief passage tonight, and I want us to think about this. The first thing I'd like for you to notice is that, uh, who, who wrote this? Who was, who was writing here? It was actually, huh, well, the Holy Spirit, yes, but it was writing through Solomon. And Solomon is speaking to somebody. He says, my son. Anybody remember who his boy is? Well, that most likely the boy that we're talking about here. Uh, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was sitting here, and he's trying to tell him some things. So he's saying, my son, or Rehoboam, he says, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days, and long life, and peace they shall add to thee. Notice there he says he's going to add peace to him. And he says, and then let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table of thine heart. He says, now listen, son, you make sure that you have mercy and that you have truth. When we see this, he says, son, I want to tell you some things. I've got some things that you need to know. And I'm going to tell you, if you'll do these things, what God is going to do. Now, son, I've learned these things. Because God has taught them to me. Amen. And I want to give them to you. And as we look here, uh, if you look at the, in the book of Proverbs, you'll find out that this is sort of a, a, a big theme that was going on there. Solomon wrote to, wrote to him, and in, in the first chapter, in verse 8, he says, Now, son, I want you to hear my instructions. In verse 10, he says, Son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And then in chapter 3, he says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. You're going to get into trouble and you're going to have some problems. And don't you despise it. God is going to correct you, but don't you let it bother you. In uh, uh, Proverbs 1.15, he says, listen, son, don't you even hang around those folks. Refrain your foot from their path. Don't hang around. These people are going to act that way. Chapter 3, he says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. In uh, verse 20, he says, hey, keep your eyes on sound wisdom and discretion. Son, look and find the good things that you need to have and to look for those. He says, now listen, in chapter 5, he says, son, I want to warn you about something. There's some strange women. You got better stay away from them. In chapter 6, he says, now listen, son, I want you to remember something. You listen. You listen. Listen to your father's instruction and don't forsake the law of your mother. I want you to listen to these family rules and keep them before you. In chapter 7, he says, I want you to keep my word. In chapter 7, verse 1. In chapter 19, he says, now listen, never listen to instruction that's going to cause you to err away from the Bible. Amen. He says, stay away from those kind of things. They're going to draw you away. As he is giving these instructions, chapter 23, he says, give me your heart, son. I want, I want your emotions. I want you to care more about what I have to say than anybody else. He says, give me your heart. You want them, uh, uh, he's saying, listen, Rehoboam, I want you to think what I have to say is more important than what your friends have to say. Right. I want you to know that it's so important that you give me your heart. He says in chapter 24, he says, son, fear the Lord and don't meddle with folks Amen. that are always changing their mind, going back and forth and back and forth. Be careful with that, son. And, and uh, as we look at this, he was trying to teach his son. And he says, this is very important to me. And I love you, son, and I, wanna, I want you to get this. And as he talks about this, he says, now listen, in chapter 3, remember, as he told him, he says, son, my son, he says, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. He says, what I'm telling you, I want you to listen very carefully. Matthew Henry described this passage as saying, it was a life of communion with God that will be of unspeakable advantage. He says, you're going to get a whole lot out of this if you allow it to make a difference in you, if you'll just dwell on it. Now, I would like for us to notice several things. The first thing I'd like for us to notice out of this passage are some precepts. These are, there's three sets of precepts that are here in this passage. In verse 1, we see that he says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. He says, Son, I want you to know something. There are things that you have to remember. Now, uh, those of you that know me, that uh, remembering is not my uh, uh, strong suit, shall we say. Uh, 
I, I forget, but he says, son, I want you to remember those things. Do you know why? Because once they become part of your heart, something that you really are concerned about, you can remember it a whole lot better. Right. Uh, you, you look around, you find people that are excited about uh, um, like uh, sports. If you have somebody that loves the Eagles, they can tell you everybody's on that team. Uh, they can tell you who's doing good and who's doing bad. To them, it means something. But to other people, they could care less, you know. Uh, and, and then you look at these other things that are going on around you, and you see these things. He says, now listen, if your heart is in it, if you get it to where it really means something to you, that your emotions are wrapped up in it, he says, that's what I want, son. He says, I want you to have thine heart keep my commandments. I want you to do it because you want to do it because you wouldn't want to hurt me. You wouldn't want to disobey me. You'd want to do these things. He says, I want your heart. And then we see not only that, but in verse 3, he says, let not mercy or truth forsake thee. Now, this is kind of interesting. He says, don't let it forsake you. So it seems like that Solomon is saying, son, I know you've got mercy and I know you've got truth, but I don't want you to let it for, uh, forsake you. Don't give up on it. Don't run away from it. Don't get away from it. it. It's something you're going to need. Mercy is when you do something that is in kindness. You don't give somebody something that they may necessarily deserve. Boy, they cut you off and they deserve to hear from you. Show them some mercy and maybe you just keep it to yourself. Uh, uh, maybe mercy is when you don't get what you actually deserve. He says, but wait a second, son. Now, you can't just be all that way. He says, you also have to have truth. Let mercy and truth be bound about thy neck. He says, I don't want to be just flopped over there that it's just going to fall off. I says, he says, I want it bound there. I want it so that it's not going to come off. I want it something that's going to hang on to you and that you're going to have mercy and truth. And the thing about it is, is if it's around your neck, you know what? Everybody else is going to notice it. It's on the outside. It's one of the first things that people are going to notice about you. They're going to see what's there. When they look at you, they're going to see that. They're going to see, do you have mercy? Do you have the truth? Do, you, do these things mean something to you? Well, hey, listen, every person in here who has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior has mercy. Amen. You've been given more mercy than what, what, what we deserve. And he's given us mercy, and he says, now you have that mercy out there, and you let folks know that you have been forgiven of something that, man, if you got what you deserve, where would you be tonight? Right. You'd be in a place called hell. Right. So if you've been given that kind of mercy, should you not be having that out in front of you where everybody can see it? Amen. And he says, not only that, but also he says, mercy and truth. Hmm, thy word is truth. He says, Amen. you have the Bible, and let the Bible be the thing that is going to be shown forth from you as you talk to others, as you carry on conversations, as you uh, carry on things in the home. Let the Bible be something that is going to uh, come from you and that they can see, and it will be helpful to them and around you. He said, now listen, you must have them. You must have truth. Uh, truth, though alone, uh, would not work real well for the king. The truth would not just work real well. He says, listen, you've got to have mercy and you've got to have truth. Uh, mercy seems, uh, would seem by itself, if that's all he had, would, would seem weak and not understanding and things would fall apart. Truth would tell you that too. You ever been around folks? There's different types of people and they have different uh, gifts, shall we say. And, uh, and some people have the gift of telling you something uh, whether you want to know it or not, don't they? And there's other folks that, that, that they're very, very merciful. They're very, very kind and gracious. And they say nice things to you, even though they know that it's not true. No, but they, they, they try to do things like that. And he says, now listen, you have to have truth and mercy. You have to have them both. Mercy alone would not do it. But wait a second. When you think about this, who can tell me, thinking about Rehoboam, what happened in his life? Did he forsake mercy and truth? Or excuse me, mercy, yeah, mercy and truth? Yeah, a little bit later on, he decided, I think I, think I have a better idea. I'm going to ask these young men what we ought to do. Oh, the, the, the weight's been heavy on you? We're going to make it heavier. That's what he did. Did he listen to his father? Did he take the instruction that was given there, the mercy and the truth that he needed to have, 
It went in one ear and out the other. And he didn't catch it. The sad thing about it is, is that he tells us there in, in uh, verse 3, he says, let, mercy and truth, or let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Now, what is he talking about here? Writing on the table of your heart. Writing on the table was taking a piece of stone and etching something in it. And you know, once you've etched it in stone, it stays there for a while. You don't believe that? Ride by some uh, graveyard sometimes. They've got things out there that have been written there for hundreds of years. And uh, some of it you can still read. But wait a second. He says, I want you to write that on the table of your heart. Now, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. He says, now listen, you all are walking epistles. When people see you, they hear more of, of what, I, uh, what we believe about God than what they're going to read in a book. And when people see us, what do they see? He says, now wh why was this going to happen? Ha here's how it happens. He says, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, Amen. not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Amen. He says, when God's word becomes a part of you in your heart, and it becomes something that you feel for, and you have emotions for, and that you're excited about, and that you want to do this because this is right, Amen. and this is what God wants, right. then all of a sudden it makes a difference in our life. And he says, now listen, Rehoboam, I want you to bind this about your neck. I want you to have mercy and truth. I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you to forsake it. And I want you to write these things on the table of your heart. He says, I want it to be inside of you and be something that means so much to you that nobody can take it away from you, that nobody's going to talk you out of it, and that you're going to do the right thing. Well, as we look at this, we think that, boy, that would be great if he had. But then we go on, and we'll notice that in verse 5, we find the third one. He says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Amen. He's saying, there's some things I want you to do. He says, the first thing I want you to do in, in this third set is just says, I want you to trust in the Lord. Amen. Now, how much does he want you to trust? Now, Every one of us trusts in something. We trust in different things. Some people trust in money. Some people trust in their friends. And some people trust in all these things around us. And, and he says, now listen, what I want you to do is I want you to trust in the Lord. Now, he says, you are to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. He says, if you're going to trust in him with all your heart, Nothing else is going to matter. It won't shake you. It won't knock you off the course. You will be able to keep right on going. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. What happens? We begin to sit back and think, hmm, I just wonder. And when you start back and you start thinking and start wondering, all of a sudden you get led astray. We all of a sudden begin to make bad choices and do things that we should not do. He says, what has to happen here? He says, I want you to understand something here. He says, when you do this, he says, you lean to your own understanding. You sit back and you say, I just don't see it that way. I can't believe that there's a God in heaven that says he loves us that would send anybody to hell. I don't understand how anybody could say that God would be upset with somebody like that. They're such a nice person. I don't know how anybody could think that they would have to go to a place called hell. They're the nicest person I ever have met. You know what? The problem comes in is I start leaning on my own understanding. That's right. All of a sudden I begin to think, okay, well, let me see if we can work this out. How can I move this in? That's what happened with people when all of a sudden they started going with the idea of, well, well, I, yeah, I believe God created, but m maybe somehow evolution works in there. Uh, maybe there's the gap theory, or maybe there's some other way that this could have worked out. Why is this? Because they're trying to wrap it around and pull it in. And he says, why? Because they're trying to lean on their own understanding. Right. If you lean on your own understanding, you're going to make some bad choices. Amen. Because what happens is we base it upon what we feel like is how we'd like for it to turn out. 
And God says, no, don't do that. He says, don't do it. He says, God's law and God's commandments have to be our rule. Amen. If they're going to be our rule, it's not only our head that's going to know, all right, this is what we're supposed to do, but it's going to be our heart is involved in it too. We're going to do it because, man, we know that's what we ought to do, and that's what God wants. He says, now listen, I want you to know something. If you do that, it's going to make a difference in your life. If you add peace in there, you're, uh, or excuse me, if you add these things in your life, peace is going to be added to your life. Right. But wait a second. He tells us something else in Psalms 119, verses 165. He says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. You know what that tells me? It's sort of a sad thing. It says, if I love the law, I'll have great peace. And not only that, that I won't get offended. So when I get offended, what does that say? I don't have great peace, and I'm not loving his law. My heart isn't all the way in it. When my heart is all the way in it, it's going to make a difference in what I do and how I look at things and how it's going to work out for me. He says, now those were the precepts that we find there. Then we see there's some promises that go along with this. This is a great thing. Hey, Rehoboam, I want you to know something. Here's what God tells us to do, and if you do these, I've got these promises for you. Notice with me, if you would please, it says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Mercy is the promising, and truth is the performing of it. He says, I want you to bind them about your neck. Don't bind them loosely. You get them nice and tight. You get it right there. Hold on to it. You're needing to have this. It needs to be near and dear to you. It'd be something that your emotions are set on. And he says, now let's look at some of these things. What's going to happen? Well, first off, he tells us, my son, forget not uh, my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Why? For length of days and long life and peace they shall add to thee. All right, uh, anybody in here want peace? <coughs> okay, well, what's he tell you you got to do? He says, forget not my law, Amen. Uh, but let thine heart keep my commandments. So if I don't keep his law, if I don't do what God says, then he says, I'm not giving you peace. You can't have that peace. And you're not going to have the long life. It, it, uh, it sort of reminds <laughs> no, I won't mention that. All right, anyway, <laughs> better not. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, w when you see this, he says, you're going to find, now what, what else does he want us to get? In verse 4, you'll notice there, he says, now listen, if you'll take this mercy and truth and not let it forsake you and write it upon the table of your heart, what's going to happen? He says, so, th so shalt thou find favor and good understanding. Now that's awful good, and I think I'd like to have that. But he says it's in the sight of God and man. Amen. He says, if you want to have this favor and good understanding, you ever sit back, you ever had times you sit back and say, Lord, I just don't understand what's going on. Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm scared to death. The, the, the problems are too big for me. I don't see which direction to go. I don't know how to solve this problem. I don't know what to do. Well, what does he tell me? He says, well, you bind mercy and truth around your neck, and you write it upon the table of your heart. And if you do that, he says, then you're going to have some good understanding. Have you ever noticed that sometimes that when people go through some awful bad things in their life, that it helps them to become much more helpful to people who have bad things happen in their life? God says, hey, uh, you know, patience is something that you should not necessarily pray for. <laughs> Uh, because it cometh by tribulation, and there's problems that are going to come in your life. And he says, now listen, he says, when God allows these things, he says, you bind mercy and truth around your neck. It'll be something where you can tell someone the truth, and you can do it with such compassion and mercy and care that it's not going to be something that's going to be such a digging thing. Have you ever had somebody tell you something, and you knew that they were just enjoying it? when they were telling you? He says, why is that? He says, because they don't have mercy and truth bound about their neck, and they don't have good understanding. They don't see what's going to happen. 
Rehoboam, what's going on here? Rehoboam, you let it go in one ear and out the other ear. And let me tell you what's going to happen, Rehoboam. Down the road, you're going to split the kingdom. You're going to divide the kingdom. Why? Because you don't have mercy. You, you, you don't have the truth. And you're going to listen to some folks that you shouldn't listen to. The folks that caused you to err from the word of God. And to err from the things that he had been told. And he says, Rehoboam, you're going to make a mistake here. Look what's going on and make sure you make the right choice. Right. You know what? Uh, back in the book of Esther, we find out that there was a man who really got it right, didn't he? Mordecai. He, he says, now listen, <laughs> Esther, we're going to have work on this thing here. We've got a problem. And you know how it works out? When you read the last few verses of the book of Esther, in Esther chapter 10, and the third verse, what you see is it says, For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren. He says, wow, isn't this something? This is the guy that they were trying to kill just a chapter or two before. This is the guy that they were making all the plans for, that the guy was so mad that he wanted to have him killed. But wait a second. God's able to take that thing and turn it all the way around. Amen. And he says, now look at that. He's accepted of the multitude of his brethren. All of a sudden, they notice him, and it's, it's all right. And it says, now listen, what else does he want us to do? He says there in chapter five, or verse 5, he says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. He says, listen, he's going to give you, he's going to make your way straight. He's going to make it so that you know what to do. You can see where, where you're going, and he'll make it so that you can go in that direction that he has for you. He says, he shall direct thy paths. He's going to tell you what the next step is. He's going to open that situation in front of you and keep it going. And he says, now listen, I want you to understand something. God gives us these promises, but then he follows it up and he says that there is a providence of God that we see here. It all goes back to verse 5. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. How much? With all thine heart. With all thine heart. There's a a red book of wisdom written by a man by the name of Damas, and it talks about when he was a young lad that his house burned down. Uh, he slept, walked out of the house, and he woke up just in time to see the firemen trying to coax his sister to jump out of the second story window. Uh, there were nine of them in the house, and all of them got out safe. He says it was miraculous because there was no smoke alarms or anything like that uh, during that time. But later on, about 30 years later, he had a friend who the fire came to their house. The thing is, is the family had gone out with the children and left um, his wife's uh, father there at the house. And while they were gone, the house burned, and he came back to a, a blazing house. They lost everything also, but they also lost him uh, in the fire. You know, sometimes we need to understand... What is of value? Amen. There's a big difference. The, the first fire actually caused a huge house, a nice house, to be burned to the ground. Worth a whole lot of money. And the second house was not that big of a house. But the difference is, is what's the difference in the market value and the family value? Amen. We need to understand what is of great value. Right. We need to find out what it is that we ought to be trusting the Lord for. Problems come, uh, but what do we trust in or that hinders us from trusting the Lord? You know one of the greatest things that hinders us is self-sufficiency. I got this. Don't worry about it. I got it under control. All of a sudden, we feel like I can take care of this, and we forget that God says, I want you to trust me. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord when you're faced with a problem. Trust in the Lord when you have a difficulty, when there's something that you just don't understand. He says, trust in the Lord. Sometimes uh, another hindrance to us trusting the Lord is friends. We feel like they'll get us out of the jam. They can help us. Who can I get to take care of my problem? But he says, are we trusting in the Lord? Sometimes what happens is, is uh, hindrances that we get so far away from God, we wouldn't even know 
if he was around. And then problems come and we just don't know what to do. But wouldn't it be nice to be like Job? Amen. He had all those problems that came in his life. Can you imagine the problems that Job faced? All the problems. But he said, though he would slay me, yet will I serve him. Amen. He says all these things. But I'll tell you what, I, I think about Job. Job lost his children. Later on, God gave him more children. Amen. I got a funny feeling that Job probably looked at those kids a little bit harder. I imagine Job probably hugged them a few more times than when he hugged the others. And probably wanted to check in with them a little bit more. Because he was very concerned. His heart was more in it. He knew what he had lost before. And God says, you better realize that there's some things that are out there. He says, but don't let the distance from God be a problem. You know one of the problems that really gets in our way? It's one of the things that we love to do. Worry. Why, you know, hey, <laughs> if you don't have a problem, hey, worry. You can create one. You can create problems that are not there. And if the problem is there, you can make it much bigger. If you worry, that's all you've got to do. And then we see these things that are there. What, how do we know this and how do we see this? Worry must be put aside. Uh, it, is, it is something that you have to put it aside. Every last one of us are going to face things that are going to come up in our life. And it's going to cause us to sit back and say, hmm, boy, what's going to happen here? Hmm, what is this? Oh, man, I wonder what that is. Oh, there's this new lump. Oh, all of a sudden there's this new ache. There's this new pain. There's this new something. Oh, I wonder what that is. Or, <laughs> oh, I feel this pain in my back. Kidney stone. Oh, no. Uh, and, and, and all of a sudden you begin to worry. You fret. And he says, listen, don't let that happen. How do we worry? We worry about the impossible. We worry about, we can tell if we've got a problem, if all of a sudden we're laying awake at night and tossing and turning. We can realize that there's a problem with worry when we begin to doubt the truth of the Bible and Bible truths. When we first rely on others before we even talk to God about it. When we begin to seek people out to say, see if they can solve our problem instead of doing what the Bible says. When we try to manipulate when we try to say, well, I can do this, I don't need to pray about it, we must, uh, and it's really sad when we get to the point where we begin to cling to others just so that we can feel secure. You know, some of us, truthfully, if we were to list all the things that we worried about and all the things that we pray about, our worry list would be longer than our prayer list, wouldn't it? <laughs> because we've got a lot of things we worry about. pastor's been speaking about uh, David do you realize that when David came back to Ziklag, when he was coming back there, if you'll notice in 1 Samuel 30 in the first verse, the first three words, and it came. That's how things come. There's always something that's going to come in your life. There's always things that are going to be there that you didn't expect. There's going to be problems. There's going to be situations that happen. There's going to be something that you did not think was going to be there. He says, now wait a second. What did David lose? When he gets there, all of a sudden all the fire that's there, as, as Pastor mentioned this, and, and you see this, he could perhaps saw the smoke of the city and they get there. And could you imagine the heart of all those men as they come up on the town and they see nothing but burned ashes. They don't see their kids. They don't see their wives. They don't see their animals. They don't see anything. All's gone. David had lost his possessions. He'd lost his wives. He lost his children, but he also lost something else. When all those men saw that, the first thing they did was they turned <coughs> to him. He says, David, why didn't we plan? Why didn't we have somebody stay here? Why in the world didn't we do something about this? We could have seen this coming. David, what, what, what were we thinking? All of a sudden, they turned to him, and they turn away from him. And all of a sudden, they blame him for all the problems. Do you know what happens, though? He gets there, he loses his joy, he loses his peace, he gets in distress. And then he says, you know what I need to do is I need to turn to the Lord. Amen. Sometimes it's easy to know what to do and awful hard to do it, isn't it? Right. And that's exactly what happens in the life of David. You know, I have a, a favorite song when uh, I go to the 
uh, hospital used to when uh, and have to visit folks, not have to visit folks, but see them in their not very good condition. And there was a, a song that we sing, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Amen. Just to rest upon his promise. You know, when we read that, and we sing that, and we hear that, does it really mean that to us? Do we really have it there where it needs to be? You know, when we think about that, we need to realize that he wants us to just trust him. Trust him. Amen. You know, then it goes on to say, and acknowledge him. God wants us to acknowledge him. How in the world do you acknowledge the Lord? Everything that we do shows what we acknowledge. That means what we put weight in. What we think is important. He says, the choices that you make are showing what you, what you think. For example, how you dress. There are some people, uh, some of these people around here, they'll, they'll wear, they'll wear uh, something that's got eagles on it. Pete, he's an Eagles fan. He'll wear something with eagles on it. Becky, she'll wear something with broncos on it. And, uh, and they'll, do, they'll wear these different things. Why? Because to them, that means something. It means absolutely nothing. But the thing is, is this. Wait a second. What do we do with how we look? You know, our face says a lot, doesn't it? It tells folks something. You know, there's different ones that, uh, now, let's suppose that somebody comes in and got black fingernail polish and black eyeliner and, and uh, uh, black lines all over the face and say, oh, they're, what, gothic. You know, they, they want to be that way. They're, they're that part of that group. And they want to be like that because they're dressing to identify because they're acknowledging who they are. You know, I thought it was kind of neat. Um, I went down to watch Rachel uh, lead the school choir for their missions conference. And they had their kids in the school dress up to identify with their missionaries. So they read off a missionary that they support and somebody would dress up like that. And it was kind of cute. One of them, they, they support... Um, a mission over in Baltimore. So they had somebody dressed up and they said, I'm homeless. <laughs> and, uh, and, they had, and they had somebody else uh, dressed up. They had a couple from Mexico. It was a little kid with this big sombrero on and all this kind of stuff. Had a little Indian girl and she has a little two feathers and all this kind of stuff. And all these things, what were they were doing? They were acknowledging something about them to help you to identify with them. What do I identify with? With how I look. With how I talk. You know, you can tell a lot about people. You can listen to them. You can all of a sudden hear, hey, are they from the South? Are they from Boston? Uh, do they put R's on words that ha don't have R's and take R's out of words that do have R's? Uh, what, are, what are they like? Uh, where are they from? You can tell so much about them. Are they from lower, slower, or what? You know, and uh, Wooder. <laughs> Uh, and as you look at these things, and all of a sudden, you, you begin to look at these, and you say, hey, you know what? My language says something about me. How I talk, what I talk about. Is it foul? Is it gutter? Is it gossip? Is it demeaning? In Colossians 4, 6, it says, let your speech always be, uh, always, excuse me, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Amen. Our actions say something. Ephesians 4.32, and be ye kind one to another. So when I'm not being kind, I'm not following God's word. When I am treating someone like dirt, I am doing just the opposite of what God wants me to do. He said, well, I can't forgive them. Well, he told us that we had to. Amen. Uh, when a child disobeys their parent and they want to say, boy, I love Jesus. No, you don't. Because Jesus gave you one thing to do, and you're not doing it. And it's easy for us to pick that out, but when it's us, is it easy for us to pick that out? He says, now, what happens here? He says, now, what about where you work or you do business or the things that you do? He says, I want you to understand something, that everything that we do is going to make a difference. Amen. He says, now, listen, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Amen. May I ask you a question? Is mercy and truth about your neck tonight? 
Are you at somebody's neck? <laughs> are you trusting in the Lord? Or are you trusting that maybe I can just get away from this a little bit? What about the promises that are given there? Do you want those? Length of days, long life, peace? Sounds pretty good. Amen. How about favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man? How about having the Lord direct your path, make it way straight and give you discretion and direction to know what to do? The question comes in, are we going to trust him? Trust him. Amen. That's all he wants us to do is just trust him. If you'll trust him, Rehoboam, put mercy and truth around your neck and write it upon the table of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. And lean not into your understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Rehoboam, you didn't do it. You split the kingdom. But wait a second. We don't have kingdoms that we have to worry about. What do we have to worry about? We have to worry about our homes. We have to worry about our workplace. We have to worry about the friends that we have, the associations we have, the people that we want to see come to Christ. Amen. And he says, what do you need to do? Trust in the Lord Amen. with all thine heart. Can you do that? Will you do that? Are you doing that? He says, if we will, he'll direct you and he'll give you peace. And he'll make your way straight.